Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you for attending this month's lecture. For our speaker today, please welcome Dr. Joel Nielsen. Hello, everybody. I'm Joel Nielsen. I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist. I work at a place called the Marshfield Clinic in central Wisconsin at their Wausau Center. I do 100% musculoskeletal imaging. Thought today I'd talk about uh, arthrography and joint injections and some of the tips and tricks that I've learned over the last about 11 years of practice. Let's see if I can get the slide to advance. There we go. Sometimes in more recent meetings that I've gone to, it seems like uh, there's some bashing of arthrograms as being unnecessary ever since the, uh, you know, increase in the amount of high field strength imaging, but I would argue that the arthrogram is not dead yet. Of course, an arthrogram is usually used in conjunction with an MRI or a CT now, and what we're trying to do is uh, deliver the contrast medium into the joint, and usually via fluoroscopy, but increasingly people are starting to use ultrasound to avoid the ionizing radiation. Some of the advantages of arthrography are that we're going to get distension of the joint to uh, separate the structures to get better definition and contrast uh, between those structures. And ideally, you'll have some contrast that will enter into the abnormality and make it easier to tell when a tendon is torn, particularly with partial tears, uh, or if ligaments are, are uh, broken, then you'll start to see abnormal communication outside of the joint or into spaces where the contrast should not flow. Of course, the shoulder is still the, the kind of the king for uh, arthrograms, at least in this practice. We also do a fair number of hip arthrograms because uh, the arthrogram is quite helpful in diagnosing the labral tear. Elbows are fairly rare in this practice, so they've done a few. I do a fair number of knees, and those are really helpful when it comes to looking at patients who have had a previous meniscectomy or a partial meniscectomy in order to determine whether or not the abnormal signal that you're seeing on the MRI is related to the post-surgical changes or it has to do with a, uh, a recurrent or a new tear. And then the wrist, when I first started out in practice, was probably the second most common thing, but I practice at a facility that has a 3T magnet, and in fact, in our system, where our hand surgeons are stationed, both have 3T magnets, and the hand surgeons seem to be pretty happy with the sensitivity and specificity that they're getting without doing the arthrogram, but rarely they'll ask for an arthrogram, and we go ahead and do that. And then also, anytime there's an osteochondral lesion, in other words, any, any joint that has an osteochondral lesion, particularly those that have been treated, to take a look at the articular surface, you get a, a pretty good look with an arthrogram. So you don't have to just take my word for it. There are some papers out there that point out the fact that uh, arthrograms are actually slightly more sensitive and uh, more specific than their conventional counterparts. This study is a little bit older, but I think it still rings true. And you see particularly um, with regard to sports medicine and uh, in this particular study, um, 14 patients that were out of the 20 pro athletes that were uh, imaged had findings that were only seen with the MR arthrogram. And like I said, you know, a lot of people argue that it's not really necessary anymore to do an arthrogram with a 3T, but still the literature shows that arthrography is still statistically more sensitive and particularly with regard to the um, partial thickness tears, slab tears, and labral tears. And the one thing I would always counter is say that 3T imaging is always better for sports medicine no matter what, as far as I'm concerned, but a 3T arthrogram is even better. So before we talk about that too much, I wanted to talk about the needle, since the needle is the uh, key tool that you, you have as a radiologist when you're doing a percutaneous interventional procedure. And uh, the more you know and understand how to guide the needle, makes your, you know, your pre procedure safer and speedier. 
So with that, I go into the anatomy. It's pretty basic and straightforward. There are two parts. There's a stylet and a cannula. Each part has two different ends, the hub end and the tip end. The tip end, of course, is the pointy end. You always want to keep that pointed away from you. The uh, cannula hub has a notch that accepts the stylet hub, and that indicates the proper alignment. Whenever you're advancing a needle that has a stylet and a hub, you want to have that stylet deployed inside of the needle system because otherwise you're going to tend to be um, taking up tissue inside of the needle. When you go to put an injectate inside, it may not flow properly because there's a little tissue stuck in the tip. That little nubbin at the, at the end of the hub indicates the direction of the bevel and um, that's especially important because the short end of the bevel is on the same side as that protrusion that sticks up. And why does that matter? The bevel of the needle, actually the needle moves along a path that bisects the angle of the bevel. So in other words, the needle is going to tend to dive away from the short end of the bevel. So just like this, if the uh, hub is at the top, your needle is going to tend to go down. And just the opposite, right-sided hub, left-sided travel of the needle, and left and right. One thing to remember is that the short end of the bevel, again, is, is always on the same side as the indicator and the needle tip moves away from the short end. One, one other point I would make is some of the metallic needles that I originally, when I first started practicing, uh, I wasn't used to those and I got them switched out right away because you couldn't feel the little hub um, and as a result, you'd have to look down and see where that hub was pointed in order to make your adjustments. So it's much better if you can actually just feel it. Some other things that will alter the trajectory include the um, tissue density. If, you, if you're dealing with homogeneous tissues, the needle will just tend to continue to course in a straight line. Whereas if you hit different needle dents or different densities of tissue, the needle will tend to follow the path of least resistance. And I'll, get, I'll show you an example of that. Here's, this isn't a joint injection, but just to illustrate the example, there's, um, here's a 47-year-old female who had neck and arm pain. I did a C6 selective nerve root block utilizing CT guidance. And you, you see here the images with the biopsy grid in place. And if you look Closely, hopefully you can see my, my mouse pointer here. There's a little thin stripe of fat in between the nerve root here and the vertebral artery. So my idea was to hit the bone, kind of glance off the bone and hopefully utilize both the bevel and the uh, guidance of, or the, the tendency for the needle to follow that path of least resistance to be able to sneak it in and get it alongside the uh, nerve root without compromising any of the structures. And here you can see the needle going in. And if you look really closely, you can see the bevel, the short end of the needle is actually pointed away, which means my hub is on this side, but I'm trying to get that needle to kind of stick to the wall of the bone. And as I advance it, it continues along that path of least resistance, do a little injection of contrast, and then away we go with the injectate. So besides being able to use the bevel to uh, guide the needle, you can al always bow the needle outside of the patient or bend the tip. I personally have never really used the bend the tip methodology, but bowing the needle is, is um, pretty helpful. So you're actually putting a little bend or bow in the, the whole needle and then insert it. And the needle will tend to follow an arc created by the bow. And the denser the tissue, the more resistance and the more the um, the needle will tend to bend. And actually on this illustration, it's from a textbook, but you can see that, that the needle tends to travel pretty straight in the, in the um, low density tissue. But then this is actually, I think, the inside of a grapefruit. When it hits the fibrous middle, it starts to really bow. Bending the tip, the only thing I would say about that is you, you can put a little bend in it, but you tend to cause more tissue injury, and uh, as a result, people will use a coaxial technique for that. So, for instance, if you were trying to place a 25-gauge needle, you would maybe place it through a 21-gauge or a 20-gauge spinal needle first to try to uh, avoid soft tissue injury along its course. Okay, so we talked about the needle. Now I want to talk a little bit about the shoulder arthrogram since that's the most common thing that we do. 
and the th I'm not going to go through this every single time, but just show you some of the differences for the different arthrogram techniques. Uh, some of the things like prerequisites and risks and materials are all very similar for all, all the uh, joint injections with some minor changes. So the first thing we want to do is obviously want to obtain a, an assigned consent. Sticking someone with a needle without signed consent is probably assault or battery and or battery. So that's, that's a good idea. Um, definitely want to get a history. And uh, your history can be particularly important because I can think of one instance where the history actually caused me to cancel the um, procedure. It wasn't well vetted apparently ahead of time and we changed it for a, a totally different procedure uh, after contacting the uh, re referral physician. But where it really helps a lot is when it comes to interpreting the CT or, or MRI after the fact. If the patient is having locking or clicking, obviously you're going to start thinking more about labral tears than a rotator cuff tear, as an example. The other thing that's very important is to always review the patient's allergies and do a timeout prior to the procedure to make sure everyone's on the same page. How I talk to the patients when we're giving the or obtaining the informed consent, I say this is a fairly generic procedure, anytime you break the skin, there's always a risk of causing an infection or bleeding, and then I typically ask them about blood thinners. If they're on blood thinners, I, I, w I won't actually stop the procedure or not do the procedure for just a simple arthrogram or joint injection, but it's good to know after the fact that you may be having to hold some pressure, or if you see a lot of oozing after the fact, it's good to know that they were on a blood thinner ahead of time rather than coming as a surprise. Some of the materials, a 20 gauge, 21 or 22 gauge spinal needle usually for the big joint injections and a 25 gauge inch and a half needle for numbing the skin and then I actually use a, a 30 gauge half inch needle to start the procedure out and I'll show you that here in a second. And of course you hook it up to tubing if it's a large joint large bore tubing and if it's a small joint micro bore tubing so that when you get into the small joint you don't want to be using your regular tubing that takes about two and a half cc's of of uh, contrast or holds about two and a half cc's of contrast because by the time you get to your injectate you'll already have filled the joint with your contrast whereas the uh, micro bore tubing usually holds about 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 cc another thing i would say is uh, this is kind of the boring part but Another thing I'd say is that, you know, go ahead and use bicarb with your lidocaine. There's no reason to be sadistic. Uh, and especially in this day and age of Prescani scores, in fact, in my institution, the clinicians actually have a certain percentage of their salary that is at risk for having poor evaluations by the patients. So it becomes increasingly more important to make your patients happy. Um, some of the old school as an example, when I first started training, I can remember the first time we did an arthrogram and there was no uh, anesthetic used at all. They went straight to a 20 gauge needle and just jammed it in there. And, you know, oh my, have times changed. So a 10 cc syringe for the numbing medicine, then a 20, and the 20 is for your contrast and depending on whether or not you're, you're doing an MRI or a CT. So getting started, you get the patient supine with arm at the side and supinated with the shoulder and external rotation. We put a lead glove on the patient's hand to help remind him or her to keep the position. And I used to use the the, te the trick of having the tech come up and, and kind of externally rotate it as much as they can stand it when I was having trouble getting to the, to the joint. But then about three or four years ago, it dawned on me, why not just do that at the beginning and save everyone a lot of time and, um, and radiation? So we just do that right from the, from the, the beginning and uh, have the patient come over right before I start to inject the patient, or uh, have the uh, tech come over right before I start the injection portion. And then when you're filling your 20cc syringe, obviously you want to remove all the air bubbles from the connecting tubing and from the syringe itself because they look like little foreign bodies. And most of the time you can tell the difference between air on MRI or and certainly on CT, but it's just, it looks slop. So um, one thing I would point out, it's just 0.1 ml of gadolinium mixed in 20 cc's of, uh, you know, 
a combination of ICV-3 uh, or ICV or whatever your X-ray dye of choice is, and then we mix that with 10 cc's of normal saline. Some people will half that and then use the other five as lidocaine to include kind of a, a diagnostic part of the injection where you know you ask the patient how much pain they're getting uh, at the beginning on a zero to ten scale, and then um, follow up at the end. But typically for the shoulders, the patients, I, I don't find that that's all that helpful. It, it's absolutely helpful with the hip, but we'll get to that in a minute. CT, on the other hand, I actually cut the ice of you with a little bit of saline because the uh, the ice view is actually hypertonic, and, and it, it's no problem when you're doing the injection, but again, in the interest of being nice to the patient, that hypertonic solution will will attract fluid into that joint later on. So they're going to actually have a bit of soreness and, and the feeling of swelling will last longer the the more solute you put into it. So in, here's just a, this was an outside film. This is what happens when you inject Pyrgad. You, you not only shorten the T2, but shorten, or sorry, the T1, but the T2, and the whole thing blacks out and you've basically ruined your uh, exam. So for the traditional shoulder anterior approach, what you want to do is target the junction in the middle and inferior thirds of the humeral head, about two millimeters inside of the cortex. And you, I use a BB marker and I exchange that marker for a Sharpie mark and a, kind of a target pattern around where the BB sat. You want to be super careful that where you pass your needle through, there's no ink on the patient's skin, otherwise you will make an ugly little tattoo. And again, very, you'll have a very unhappy patient. Alternatively, a lot of people will take a needle cap and press that hard down into the patient's skin to make a little dent. Prep and drape, definitely want to use sterile techniques, sterile gloves, sterile equipment. You don't want to cause a septic joint. That's very poor form and knock on wood, I think I've done five or 6,000 injections somewhere in that range and haven't had that problem yet. I clean with betadine. I do three three separate cleans with betadine and then three separate cleans with isopropyl alcohol. There are all, all sorts of legitimate ways you can do it. I'm just telling you how I, I do it. The main thing with betadine or any um, prep that you put on the patient's skin is that you want it to sit on the skin as long as possible uh, to, to actually work. The longer it sits, the longer it, or the better it works. One um, quick little story I'll tell you. Uh, at, um, at my fellowship, they said that Everyone in the, in, in the country was using isopropyl alcohol to prep their patients until NASA started their space program and the mercury capsules came back from space and then they saw everyone swabbing down the capsules with betadine uh, in order to, because they didn't know, you know, what they were going to find, but just in case there were space bugs up there. So they thought, you know what, if it's good enough for NASA, it's good enough for us. So they switched over to betadine. I, I don't know, that may be an urban legend, but you have to look that one up. Anyways, the next step is to anesthetize the skin. Uh, what, like I said before, I, I tend to use buffered lidocaine, and I start out with a 30-gauge needle. Another thing I learned over the last probably five years, I've not ever made a skin wheel. It's absolutely unnecessary, and it's kind of cruel. What you end up doing when you make an, a wheel is make a little blister on the skin, and it hurt, hurts like Hades. And it turns out it's, it's completely unnecessary. The last thing I would say is make sure you wait for the lidocaine to work. It only takes about 30 seconds, but just wait those 30 seconds. And what I do is I, I stick a 30 gauge needle in you know, for just very superficial numbing. I go straight in along my target line. I infuse the lidocaine and then I pull straight back out. I take the 25 gauge after about 15 or 30 seconds. Uh, and then I go straight down the exact same hole, hopefully and then infuse and pull it straight back out and then after I, I usually wait after that one for 30 plus seconds and then I, I put in the um, the spinal needle which in my kit is a 20 gauge but it's perfectly acceptable to use a 21 or 22 and I find that usual, utilizing this technique I have so many patients that tell me oh wow I had this before and it was absolutely awful and this was just fine I, I hardly felt anything I only usually the only thing they feel is the 25 gauge going in the rest of it is fairly painless so like I said you in, insert your spinal needle you wait you push it down until you contact the bone at the target site and then usually what you want to do is you want to back off slightly because if you're down to the bone that means that you're um, the little opening for the needle is probably 
stuck into the periosteum. And then you, you back off slightly, twist the hub, and then inject. What I do is inject a tiny amount of lidocaine. And if you don't feel any resistance, you're probably in the joint. Then I hook up to the um, to the connecting tubing with the um, contrast and uh, usually put in somewhere between 12 and 14 ml of contrast, depending on how big the person is. Um, sometimes a little bit less, some petite patients or uh, in, in children. And then remove the needle, clean up the skin, and place a Band-Aid. No, I don't do any post-injection exercise. It goes straight to MRI or CT for the additional imaging. We find that post exercise just tends to muck up your field where you did the uh, injection, so there's really no need for it. One thing I would say with the exception to that would be is if the patient is post-surgical and they have metallic hardware that's in the area of interest. For instance, if the patient has had a shoulder reconstruction, and, or not reconstruction, but had a, uh, the, for instance, their spinous or uh, supraspinatus, gosh, tendon repaired and there's metallic anchors, then you can get a lot of bloom artifact right um, at the, you know, foot plate of the of the uh, rotator cuff. And in those cases, what I'll end up doing is um, doing the, you know, external, internal rotation views and even a scapular Y view. So I basically perform a conventional arthrogram with the fluoro setup prior to um, doing, sending them off to CT or MRI and then find out afterwards that, oh, wow, we can't see anything. So um, at least I have the pictures. And, and before we do that, we just, in that case, we do have them exercise the joint to kind of move that contrast around a little bit. All right, so this is, um, this is what that anterior approach to the shoulder looks like. This is uh, an image from UW-Madison's uh, MSK section, which is a great resource if you have any questions about how to do an MSK procedure, they have all kinds of stuff on there. We used to do it this way, uh, but again, I found that there's a better way to do it, and let's see, I'm going backwards. And the reason for this, you see this little Minecraft version of the subscapularis muscle here, and that needle is going right through the subscapularis, and, and sometimes right through the myotennis junction of the subscapularis and again it can cause problems when you're when you're going to interpret the images because you can get some staining from from your injection site or some extravasation from the injection site and if there's a better way to do it why not do it so for probably about nine years now I've been doing nothing but the rotator interval approach and everything else is exactly as we just talked about but the difference is, is that the target instead is in the upper one-third of the, the humeral head and the advantage that you have for this is that you are actually putting your needle straight down right where the orthopedic surgeon sticks his scope when he when he doesn't arthroscopy of, of the shoulder and the, the orthopedic surgeons don't think there's anything important there <laughs> so therefore why should we so here's kind of your target zone and here's what an example looks like. There's my BB marker. I uh, stick my needle down after I put the, the Sharpie mark, and then you see the, the contrast moving away from the needle tip, and there's hardly any resistance. There, there we go. The one thing you are looking for, though, in this, in this uh, is that you see the, the joint capsule outline, and you want to make sure that you're not seeing contrast go up into the um, subacromial or the subdeltoid bursa, which would indicate that you have a full thickness rotator cuff tear. And every once in a while, you know, it, it's harder to see unless you exercise the joint and you're doing a conventional arthrogram, the, the, the partial tears. But there, like I said, there's really no reason to do that because you're going to pick them up no problem on the MRI or the CT portion. So here's an example of uh, a CT arthrogram, and you can see, and I'm only showing it to show you that it, they're actually worth something. They're not uh, worthless, as one might think. Here's an example where we have a full thickness rotator cuff tear. The supraspinatus is completely torn. Its uh, myotennis junction is is uh, right about here, so it's medially retracted. And we can see that the muscle belly is atrophic and there's fatty infiltration. So and, and in case you're not sure how to look or evaluate the uh, supraspinatus, you should always take a look at the acromion here and draw a line across. Um, and and the uh, muscle belly should be right up to that level or a little bit above it.
Um, here's an example of a, a partial tear of the undersurface of well, it's probably the supraspinatus, infraspinatus junction, somewhere like that. These are also helpful for um, labral tears that I don't think I have an ex example. So I'm going to mute for one second and take a drink. Okay, and you're probably getting sick of my voice. Here we go. So what if the patient is allergic to contrast? First thing I, I say with this is, let's make sure that the slide advance, is the patient actually allergic to contrast? So this, this was actually said to me. I had a coronary artery CT and it made me feel hot and it felt like I had to pee. Well, and of course, if you've ever had a CT coronary artery uh, angiogram, that's how everyone feels. That's not an allergy, that's just part of the test. Same thing, I felt nauseous or I threw up after the injection for the MRI. And of course, they're talking about the toxic effects of the contrast rather than having a true allergic reaction. So if, if it's one of those things, we can just go ahead and proceed as if the patient doesn't have an allergy because they don't. Um, if they do have an allergy, it's important to determine how severe the previous allergy was. If it's hives or itching, you can consider pre-medicating the patient. However, if they had anaphylaxis, absolutely no reason to use um, x-ray dye. So what I tend to do is um, I do the, the injection via feel, and what I, what, how I describe you feeling that low resistance um, uh, after you've planted the needle all the way down to the bone and backed off a little bit. And uh, I just do it by feel and again, knock on wood, I, I've not missed a joint that way. I've, I think I've missed a joint maybe two or three times in 10 or 11 years now and uh, where I got fooled. Yeah, that I have pretty good success with, with just doing it by feel. Um, another way to do it is to use ultrasound completely legitimate. I've been doing more and more ultrasound over the last probably three years. And I've heard of some practices are actually using ultrasound to do their injections. We, we do a fair number of injections, so I, I, probably the most I've ever done in a day is eight, uh, and average three or four, probably something like that. So in the fluoro team is quite proficient at what they do, and uh, so I, I just don't mess with it and kind of continue doing what I'm doing under fluoroscopy. The other thing that I learned is that um, not for an arthrogram, but if you're just doing a joint injection and you want to prove you're in the joint, you can always use pure gadolinium uh, because it, it actually will show up under, under fluoroscopy, just not as dense as the x-ray contrast. Okay, so the next thing, probably the next most common thing to um, do is a, is a hip arthrogram. Again, patient supine, you want to internally rotate the hip, and again, I use a sandbag to make sure that they're rotated in. You, for this one, you want to mark the femoral artery. Actually palpate the femoral artery, and you place, just make a little Sharpie mark on the patient's skin so that you're, um, you want to avoid these structures right here. This is where the femoral nerve runs, and the femoral artery and the femoral vein. And un unfortunately, depending on how the patient is positioned, they could be kind of canted to one side, or uh, you know, have a little bit of aberrant anatomy. You want to um, stay away from the medial part of the femoral head as much as possible. I actually had a guy who was terrified to have his hip injected, and I asked him why I was terrified, and he said that somebody did this and they they skewered his femoral nerve and it gave him a foot drop for about two weeks. So he wasn't looking forward to it, but anyways, uh, we did not cause another foot drop, and I'll show you why I didn't cause a foot drop in just a second, but um, aim for the lateral third of the, the femur, and then um, again, for the hip, I like to inject either lidocaine or ropivacaine usually ropivacaine recently, um, and get a pain scale before and after so that we can help pin down where the pain is coming from. But Because unlike the shoulder, although you, there's some crossover with cervical problems, the hip and back pain can be sometimes difficult to sort out. Which reminds me of a famous saying that uh, one of my trainers, Dr. Ali Abadi, who was at Peter Ben Brigham back in the days, been there forever. And uh, one of his favorite sayings was, Joel, 
cannot a man be both bald and drive a car at the same time? And of course, what he meant was, can't you have two things going on at once? <laughs> Which I'll never forget, and that's great. So uh, back back to the arthrogram. We get um, that's kind of what it looks like when you do uh, and do the hip arthrogram with an anterior approach, and you're just basically going straight down at the target. So um, what I also learned from Dr. Ali about it was that there's a better way to do this, and ever since this is the way I've done it. What I do is an anterolateral approach where I'm actually going over the top of the greater trochanter. I'm placing two BB markers, and the second marker is at my target site. I draw uh, my little my little target here with the sharpie, doo -doo 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 -doo, and then little dash line, and um, I put the needle in and going down at a 45 degree angle and aim out laterally. And even if my needle were to stray over in this direction, by the time I hit the bone, usually I'm uh, underneath the nerve artery and vein. So it's kind of a, it's a nice trick and it's particularly useful when you're aspirating a total hip. Because as you, as you can imagine, if the patient has a hip replacement and this is all metal and this is all metal and this is all metal uh, and you place a BB over the metal and you take a fluoroscopic image, what do you see? nothing. So it's kind of nice when you, you go out uh, over here and you can kind of get the, at least the needle path and then you, f you can feel it when your uh, needle contacts the metal femoral head. So here's our target zone. There we go. Why is this important on MRI? Well, you can see the sensitivity is far, far better with an MR arthrogram compared to uh, conventional MRI. And again, this is a little bit older study and these numbers have come up uh, with the uh, deployment of 3T magnets all over the place. But still, MR arth arthrograms are, now they're probably like 98 or 99% sensitive, uh, whereas the conventional uh, arthrograms are in the 50s and 60s. Here's an example of an MR arthrogram of the hip with a labral tear, you see right there, a little contrast going in. There, and right here, another example. Next most commonly for us is a, a knee, and uh, I started out using the lateral approach, which is basically what most clinicians will do in the office. What, what they're doing is um, flexing the knee on a foam wedge, relaxing the quadriceps, and then what you're doing is you're actually pulling the, la the, uh, pat the patient's patella out laterally, and you're gonna sneak your needle underneath um, it, from the lateral side and um, aim towards the the patient's uh, opposite shoulder. For two things that I found with that, uh, especially if the patient has any problem with um, subluxation, the last thing they want you to do is to touch their patella. It's a creepy feeling if, if your patella is relaxed and someone starts pulling on it. So um, again, back to that Prescani thing, people don't like that. The other thing is that if you think about it, even though we only use a 25 gauge needle for the um, patella here, I'll show you. Here's the kind of where the, the BB marker is. That needle is going to scrape across the articular surface of that lateral facet of the patella. And am I doing a lot of damage there? I don't know, but I don't want to do any. So there you go. And we inject the contrast. So this was an older exam that I did. And since then, now I've, I've transition to where I do all my knee injections, whether it's an arthrogram or for, um, you know, for just a knee injection, I use this, this anterior approach. And w what do we do here is I, I do feel where the patella is and then come down about a centimeter and then over about a centimeter. So we're staying away from the patellar tendon and where our target is then the uh, medial femoral trochlea there. So you see, here's, here's what this looks like. And proof that these things are actually helpful. So now where these are particularly hel helpful, this of course is a, a CT image, CT arthrogram versus an MR, is on patients who've already had a meniscectomy or a, or a partial meniscectomy. If you look at those post-operative studies, they can be a real bear. It's a challenge to tell whether or not, because the patient's already been operated, there's abnormal signal in a, a deformed remnant of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, as an example. And unfortunately, a lot of times that, that will scar down and, and it still looks like a tear on MRI. But how we can tell the difference on 
on MR arthrograms is if that contrast flows up into that defect, uh, as it was explained to me, no self-respecting surgeon would ever leave a hole big enough in that meniscus for you to drive your car through. So, and here's an example of a, a bucket handle tear. And of course, uh, CT versus MRI, if you're thinking to yourself, well, why would we do CTs? Well, the reason is some, some of these patients who have these things, of course, are not MR friendly because they have a pacemaker or a spinal stimulator, as an example, or severely claustrophobic. So we'll, we'll do a CT arthrogram of whatever joint instead of MR and had some pretty good success with that. Like I said before, the wrist arthrogram, I think, was probably the second most popular thing, and it's really starting to fall out of favor, at least around here just a 25 gauge needle and for this one you want to aim just at the inferior pole of the scaphoid and, the, and go straight down on it but right on the edge so that you you sort of coax the needle off the edge and have it fall into the joint you'll feel it fall into the joint and then do I do the same sort of thing with the test injection the only thing that's different with the wrist arthrogram is that and you see there's the target area that I was talking about the thing that's different is that you want, this is more of a dynamic exam, um, because you want to see what communicates with what in the risk compartments, and uh, so you're going to obtain spot images as you go, and you can see the contrast flowing away from the needle tip, and you don't see any, any contrast heading up through that scaphalinate interval, but what we do see is that there's contrast diving down into the distal radial ulnar joint, so we know just from this fluoroscopic part of the exam that we're going to look extra hard for a uh, tear of the triangular fibrocartilage. And this doesn't show it that great, but <laughs> trust me, there was one there. But we do see the fluid here, and that fluid, in, in this case, does not belong there. I do a fair number of ankle injections, but not so many arthrograms. Same technique, though, for both palpating the dors dorsalis pedis pulse because it's really poor form to stick your needle through an artery, although, you know, people in the interventional suite do it on purpose all the time, and I'm only using a 25-gauge needle, so it's not the end of the world. It just means you're going to take some time to hold a little bit of pressure. And again, uh, I make uh, put a little BB marker on there and exchange it for a Sharpie. You can use whichever version you want. I have the patient place their foot down on the table so it's like we're shooting a lateral view, and and then for this one, I use the microbore tubing that I talked about and inject about five cc's of contrast into the joint. And it looks like this to start out with, I should say. This was probably actually taken from a, a steroid injection because you see the arthritis and the hypertrophic changes here on the, on the patient's ankle. And then um, the other thing that's quite useful for, this is a CT arthrogram, probably a patient who is post-surgical for a little tiny osteochondral defect, but you see this is bone here and there's some overgrowth of the articular cartilage, or actually it's yeah, just a teeny bit of overgrowth. It's actually just filled in pretty nicely. So, uh, And then here's an example of contrast spilling out of the joint, and this patient had a tear of the anterior talofibular and the calcaneofibular ligaments. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the joint in injections. I have better pictures that come with this. But basically the same idea, we're going to, same techniques involved, so we don't need to go over that stuff again. But corticosteroids are asked for a lot, usually in conjunction with anesthetics. And sometimes anesthetics alone just for diagnosis. I've also been doing quite a few sodium hyaluronate uh, injections, uh, also known as Synvisc or Gel-1, and I'll talk a little bit about that in here in a second. And with these, you always want to get a, a pain scale pre and post. The one thing that you'll find out or learn, if you don't know it already, is that if the patient's pain scale is cut by half or more, they have a tendency to benefit from the steroid because the idea is that the, the uh, pain is actually coming from the inside of the joint rather than from some other source. The other thing I would point out is that aspirations are basically joint injections in reverse. So if you can do, an, uh, do a joint injection in any joint, you certainly can do an aspiration. And I've been asked to aspirate just about every joint I can think of uh, at least one time. One other um, tip or trick that I would uh, point out is that lidocaine is 
bacteria static. So when you're when you're doing this, try not to penetrate into the joint when you're doing your um, numbing. Uh, just numb up to the edge of the joint and then stop there. So some recent basic science reports have come out. Um, University of Wisconsin was all over this, and as a result, we've actually changed how we practice. Um, but they've shown that all the local anesthetics are actually chondrotoxic to human articular cartilage, but only shown in vitro. And of them, ropivacaine is the least of, of the offenders. And you can imagine how many um, of these injections have taken place over the, the history of medicine. It's like a ridiculously large number. So at the end of these articles, they basically say, you know, use caution, but we basically don't know if it's okay to keep doing this or not, but we're going to keep doing it until we do further investigation. So how this changed our um, practice is that we no longer use bupivacaine in the joint because that was shown to be the most chondrotoxic, especially in the higher uh, concentrations, and we switched over to ropivacaine. Uh, we'll still use bupivacaine outside of the joint, for instance, in a bursa, because bupivacaine actually has um, a, a property of being able to break a positive feedback loop with regard to pain, and I'm not sure that the other ones do that. Some contraindications to intraarticular injection you can see there. Um, probably the biggest one to know is, well, besides injecting straight through an, 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 a raging infection, is uh, don't inject into a, a prosthetic joint. The absolute worst thing you can do is introduce bacteria into an otherwise healthy artificial joint. And because you're not only going to cause one gigantic operation, you're going to cause two. They're going to have to pull the the joint out and replace it with an antibiotic impregnated spacer and then go back in at a later date after the patient has a bunch of IV antibiotics or oral antibiotics and, and intra-joint antibiotics and then have to have a second, which of course will be their third operation. I have. That said, there's a little asterisk there because that means I did it once. Um, but I would say I, I only did it once because we had a sick dilemma, and it was with the premier orthopedic surgeon who handles all, all the revisions and uh, disasters for the whole region. He's just an absolutely outstanding surgeon who knows hip replacements up and down. He asked me to do it, so I did it. There's always an exception. So here's some of the steroid options. Um, we tend to use Depramedrol in our, in our uh, practice, although some, some of the uh, rheumatologists ask for Kenalog. I used to use uh, De Decadron when I was um, doing the uh, cervical epidural steroid injections. Here's, uh, here's what that goop looks like that we inject into the, uh, well, it's FDA approved for the knee injections, but the uh, sodium hyaluronate is rooster comb protein, and it's either actually distilled from actual rooster combs, maybe they make a deal with Tyson, I'm not sure, or have bacteria farm it. And I got a bunch of stuff from their website here just to see what this is the exact little guy that I inject, uh, usually two or three times per week. According to them, it lubricates and cushions the joint, decreases the pain and discomfort. Pretty much the idea here is that you're going to you know, delay the need for replacement surgery. Someone who's not really all quite ready to have their joint replaced, and on average, it's it, usually about 2.1 to 2.3 years. Gives them extra extra time before they can't tolerate it anymore. And these injections, you you can do every six months safely. And here's a golden doodle be, you know, being taken for a walk or vice versa by a glob of that stuff. And I don't know why that's in their advertising, but I thought it was cool enough to be in a lecture. So um, same approach. Everything is basically the same for the joint injection. And I just want to show you the example here, just except here's a real world example. And this was actually uh, one of my patients who agreed to be photographed. So now um, this is a patient's 
lateral hip, and this is an oblique image, so it's kind of hard just to get you oriented. The patient's uh, head's up on this side and the feet are down on this side. Those are those BB markers or nipple markers, as they call them. You see here, this is the first one, and I'll exchange that for a mark. I make my little dot align towards the target. And the other thing I'd point out is that you want to, you know, when you line up your fluoroscopy, it's got that little laser light. You want to try to put that little laser light pretty close to that BB marker. We have an uneven floor, so sometimes we can't get it exactly on top, but ideally it would be smack dab right where you want to go. And the reason for that is a physical property called parallax, which I didn't really make a slide on, but it's just, it's the same issue for shooting or hunting where you think two things are lined up, but you're but because of the distance between the two points, they're really not. Everything has to be in perfect alignment for for you to have a true aim at your target. So you can look that up afterwards if you want. So here's what, after uh, drop those, take a little image, that's what it looks like. This was just last week. And, and then I pull the BB markers off. You can see those, the marks with the Sharpie that I made. And then here's my standard arthrogram tray. This one uh, we have custom made. Uh, apparently I do enough of these that they thought I was worth having a custom tray, but a little uh, needle box. So every time I you know, use something, it goes in the needle box. You wanna make sure you don't stab yourself or your friends, uh, only the patient when and where you want to. And then I just, like I said, I use uh, betadine and this is just rubbing alcohol with a couple four by fours my sterile drape that I use, and then my connecting tubing. And then those, these are the various needles here. I'll show you in a second, a little bit better. I might have a little bit of OCD. I'll let you be the judge. But I line them up in order that I'm gonna use them, and including the needles. And you can see, here's one of the coolest tricks I learned, is that if you are consistent about what you put in which syringe, it will help you because when you come into work sometimes, you're gonna be, you know, you may have kids, you're gonna be exhausted, you might have had a fight with your spouse, you might be in ventricular tachycardia, which happened to me. <laughs> um, but I still successfully did my procedures for the day, and the reason was is because I do the same thing every time. And um, what some people do is they, they'll put a, a, a little label on here and write down lidocaine, a little label on here and write down contrast. But boy, that takes a long time. So what I do is I always, always put my lidocaine in the 10 cc syringe. I always put my uh, Isoview in, in a 5 cc syringe and I always put my steroid in the 3 cc syringe. And then whatever goofy thing I have left over is it always goes in here. And, and I say that because uh, I also do epidural steroid injections, and sometimes it'll be saline for a flush, or it'll be bupivacaine if it's something outside of the joint, or inside of the joint, now we just do ropivacaine. But every single time, do the same thing, it will serve you well. It, particularly when some of the steroids are also clear, so otherwise you have, everything looks exactly the same on the table, and you're not sure which is which, and what if the label falls off? When you pick something up and you look at it, are you really gonna take the time to read the label? I mean, okay, anyways. Uh, so here's an example of the needles that I use. This is that 30 gauge, and you, as you can imagine, you can barely see it in the photograph. It is great. People don't mind as much being poked by this. Whoops, let me back up just a sec. And then uh, the 25 gauge, and then again, the, the uh, more monster sized 20 gauge spinal needle. And uh, the other little thing I would tell you is it's all about for all these procedures is, you know, steady hands. You can sort of see I'm using my left hand to steady and I'm advancing with my right thumb, but even my right hand, I have tripoded against the patient. My fingers are here, everything's super steady. And when you do this, you want to go in at about a 45 degree angle. And there's the needle that's the, for the first shot. I'll tell you, I actually probably, you know, I took a, probably an extra two shots just so I could show you guys this. I wouldn't normally uh, need to or want to take these shots, which brings up, you know, the, the fact that you want to use as little radiation as possible when you're talking about these, the techniques uh, involved in this. I would say that my average is about three seconds of fluoroscopy time for a shoulder or a hip. Uh, my record is under one second for both. And then a knee, 
is probably around three or four seconds also for the average. And I can I can tell when I go back and I look at uh, patients who have been injected before and it's and if it says like you know five or eight seconds of fluoroscopy then I know I had a, had a little bit of trouble getting into the joint and sort of tip me off and then I'll look specifically where I where I went. So here I'm advancing it again and again see my left hand is is holding on and and keeping everything nice and steady. It's not making a big deal about pushing the needle in here but just to show you the technique because. Learning one time the proper way to do it will save you hours and hours of agony later on. So now uh, I've gone down and I've pushed to the bone like I talked about, and I've done my little twist, and now I, I hook up the lidocaine. I do a wet-to-wet -wet connection, even with a drip a little lidocaine into the, into the hub, and I do it every single time, whether I'm doing an arthrogram or whether I'm doing a, um, a joint injection. And I'll tell you, you don't need to do it for the joint injection because who cares? doesn't hurt anything to put any put air inside of the joint. We used to do um, double contrast studies all the time on purpose, but if it's all about being consistent. So when you know you don't want to inject air, you don't you don't want to get confused or whatever. So anyways, I just stick to the same plan each time. Hook up the uh, connecting tubing and inject a little bit of contrast and here you go. There it is. Starts to fill the joint. How exciting. Inject aid follows that. And then you can apply the same principles to any any joint. And like I said, I think I've been, I, I just grabbed a couple of random ones that I had recently. Uh, here's a, a hockey player with a pubic symphysis, and all I did was just take this 25 gauge needle and step it off the side um, of the bone into the joint. He um, came back about three months later for a follow-up injection because they got into the playoffs. So even though this was not the nicest injection to do for the patient, I should say, it, it uh, you know, it wasn't so bad that it, it kept him from having another one. Let's see, we're going, okay, and then here's a greater trochanteric bursa, again, uh, do what I say, not what I do, here's, this one's lined up, and the laser's obviously way off, but we did adjust it um, before we put it in there, and you can see I'm just looking straight down on top of the, the needle. You can barely tell it's a needle. Um, and you go down to the bone and then just kind of edge it off until you fall fall off the edge. And then inject a little bit of contrast and you'll be right inside of that greater trochanteric bursa. And you can see that bursa is inflamed and enlarged. Here's an example of a bursa that looks, and notice the difference, that one's smooth and this one's got kind of an undulating uh, irregular appearance on the inside and that one's nice and smooth. So a normal bursa. Here's a, an elbow, same idea, lateral approach going uh, right off the radial head or the uh, capitellum, whichever it takes. I guess it was capitellum. And then inject your contrast. Here's a, uh, we'll kind of speed through the whole rest of this. And here's a tail and navicular joint, same idea. You can also use CT guidance, and I do my SI joints this way. We use a biopsy grid. You get the table position that you, where you want to do the um, joint injection. You draw a laser light across the, the backside of the patient here, and then just count over how many ever you're going to do. And again, exchange that grid for the Sharpie marks, and then they place the needles one at a time into the joint. Okay, here's a couple of cases just to show you that arthrography is cool. There's a 19-year-old with um, a skiing injury. Obviously, he's got a, uh, a shoulder dislocation. We did the, an MR arthrogram, and you can see on the T1 fat sat axial image, there's a little something going on here, but could you say with 100% certainty that this is a tear? And if it is a tear, can you classify what kind of tear it is? I couldn't, so we did what's called an ABER view, which is abduction and external rotation and with the ABER position what you're doing is you're stretching the inferior glenohumeral ligament putting it in tension and um, it allows the contrast to then flow between the labral tear and the glenoid and you can see here now on the ABER view there's this is the anterior inferior aspect of the glenoid and it, we see the, uh, the torn labrum and then there's an intact periosteal sleeve kind of holding everything down, but that just popped right out, and it was uh, barely visible on the standard technique.
And uh, of course, this is called a Perthes lesion. Here's, I don't think we really have time to talk about all these different things, but you can look these up, the, the various uh, bank heart variants. And uh, orthopedic surgeons here actually like to know what they're getting themselves into before they scope the patient. So these are, these are pretty uh, important. Here's a 21-year-old college pitcher, and he was complaining of clicking, which, again, you know, tips me off right away that we're probably going to run into uh, a labral problem. You see there's some contrast here that's undercutting the um, anterior superior aspect of the labrum, but you notice this part is actually pretty parallel to the uh, glenoid surface, and just on this one view, I wouldn't necessarily call this a tear because there's some uh, anatomic variants that can have that appearance. But then you see it takes a turn out laterally. This is clearly a tear of the anterior and the superior aspect of the labrum extending back posteriorly, and then there's the big tip off there. It's communicating with a paralabral cyst. So this is, uh, of course, a slap tear. And uh, here's another ex example of one of those bank heart variants. This one's the GLAD lesion, which is a glenolabral articular disruption. Usually that's from a forced adduction injury. And you see, besides the labrum, there's actually contrast going under the articular cartilage. Uh, here's a 32-year-old who fell, out, fell on an outstretched hand or a foosh injury, and the conventional arthrogram, the only thing that might catch your eye is this, this contrast kind of goes a little bit lower than we normally see in the axillary pouch. But usually don't worry about it too much until we get the uh, MR images, and here we have T1 fats at coronal and T2 fats at coronal, and you can see that the patient actually has an evulsion of the inferior glenohumeral ligament or a Hegel lesion that's allowing that contrast to extravasate outside of the joint. Uh, here's an example similar um, with uh, cartilage delamination in a 61-year-old who also had a, a labral tear, which you can see better on this. Okay, here's a, uh, an arthrogram patient. Uh, one thing just to point out is that um, don't get too fixated on just your T1 fat sat images, which of course are great for the contrast. You still have to keep in mind the T2 images are very important. The reason is, is because the contrast is contained by the joint and you see the you know, this is the supraspinatus is thickened and it looks pretty nasty here. But if we look at the T2 weighted images, we can see the fluid. This is fluid from the the injection, but here's fluid that was just there before because there's no contrast in it. And we see there's a bursal sided tear. Here's proof. And we'll continue on. Here's another, just another uh, garden variety slap lesion. But again, this one goes up into the biceps anchor. The orthopedic surgeons like to know that ahead of time as well. There are over 10 uh, different classifications of slap lesions. We don't really seem to care too much about those here. Around here, every practice will vary. They do like to use the word slap one, and everybody knows that just means it's, it's frayed, but it, there's not a frank tear. Um, if you see a bucket handle tear, please send me a copy of it. Um, here's uh, another arthrogram. And Speaking of normal variants, you can see that the anterior superior aspect of the labrum is hypoplastic or, or missing, and this is our middle glenohumeral ligament. It's thickened and cord-like, and that, of course, is a Buford complex. And some of the other normal variants include the sublabral foramen and sublabral recess, and these were the ones where I was talking about where they, they'll parallel the surface of the, the glenoid, so you don't want to confuse those with a tear. There's some question as to whether or not there's a similar setup in the hip. One other thing I'll say about the hip briefly is that when you're looking at the hip in cross-section like this, the inferior part of the, of the hip almost never tears. All the labral tears are up here. Well, with unless the patient's in like, a, you know, a, an airplane accident or something ridiculous. Here's a 19-year-old pitcher with uh, shoulder pain and instability. We'll see if we can do this in one minute. And again, another uh, slap tear. And this one goes down. The only difference is this one actually extends down into the posterior aspect of the labrum. Here it is with the, uh, the probe. Uh, this is patting myself on the back that the uh, surgeon agreed with me. There we go. And here's another Hagel. And I think we're just about out of time. I say ultrasound advantages, just want to point out, there's no ionizing radiation, so you don't have to give any IV contrast. It's great when the patient has uh, uh, an allergy or you don't want to expose everyone in the room to radiation. 
like I said, it's becoming increasingly more common. I've been doing a fair number of joint injections, and probably the most prolific thing I do is to aspirate and lavage calcific tendonitis uh, and use ultrasound guidance to do that. And that's a great technique to get in your pocket, but that would require a whole separate lecture. Uh, disadvantages, it's difficult to see the bone and you're only seeing the outside surface of the bone. Obviously, there's a small field of view and it's time consuming and uh, you have to have some practice with it. So here's, everybody knows what this looks like. And there's resources for you to look at. You know, I'll keep it on the screen for a second. There's that MSK website I was talking about and a radiology assistant. I stole like a, a two pictures from them or something like that. And here's some references to make it look important. There we go. And that's right on time. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Nielsen. Does anybody have any quick questions for him? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't see any coming in. Um, just one quick announcement for everyone. Um, we're going to try to squeeze in our May lecture before the oral boards, so that will be Wednesday, May 10th, and will be an ultrasound lecture. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Nielsen. We really appreciate your time. Thanks. It's an honor to be asked. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs>